Okay, everyone. Um, <laughs> so, today, uh, Professor Pat Newcomb is going to be lecturing. Um, she is currently the Associate Dean for Library and Information Resources at Western New England University School of Law, and she's been there since 2011. Um, and she is also a professor of law there and teaches lawyering skills, advanced lawyering skills, and advanced legal research. So today she will be lecturing on intersexuality and the law. This is going to be filmed as well. Um, just a heads up to everyone. So <laughs> don't be nervous. Uh, so I would like to give uh, a hand for Professor Newcomb, please. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really grateful to have the chance to talk again about uh, intersexuality. I was here once before last year. Um, and this is an issue that, can everybody hear me okay by the way? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. So, so. Can you hear in the back? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay, I'll talk a little louder. Um, that, that's better, right? It's an issue I have uh, strong feelings about because children are desperately in need of our protection uh, from the unnecessary cosmetic genital surgeries that are taking place today. Still taking place today, <laughs> I should say. And tomorrow, October 26th, uh, marks the um, annual Intersex Awareness Day, so it's an appropriate day for me to be here. And each year there are more and more events more happenings and activities going on that day, more articles, more video being published, more media coverage about the experience of individuals with intersex traits, and more discussion about um, intersex human rights violations. Can I just ask, uh, are, are, is everyone familiar with intersex, the concept? Okay. Um, you know, it's amazing how many people are not and um, the general public. And uh, more and more, I, I'm thrilled to see more and more media coverage out there every year. And more and more uh, state legislatures getting involved. Well, not that many, but another one, there's two. One state tried this year and another state made it. I'll, I'll talk about that later on. But there's more going on. There's more momentum going on. Um, so first of all, um, let me tell you how I came to research and write about this topic of intersexuality in the law. I, I read this book by um, Julie Greenberg. <laughs> she wrote this book called Intersexuality in the Law. It's the Bible on this topic. Um, it's a little out of date. I think it was published in 2012. But I had never actually heard of intersexuality before that. This was several years ago, maybe four years ago that I read her book. But it was, it was such an um, interesting book, so well done, and it, it really made an impression on me about um, that we, we really need to help protect the children that are suffering uh, from the um, unnecessary cosmetic genital surgeries that are happening. <coughs> and I knew I wanted to write something on this, and I was trying to think, you know, what would be the best thing that I could do? Um, and I thought, you know, an annotated bibliography would probably be the most effective in that I would read all the scholarly literature out there on the topic and um, update it. And it might help to spread the word to you know, colleagues throughout the country on, on this topic. Because um, I don't know if any of you use annotated bibliographies. Have any of you used them in your research? Yeah, they're really great, aren't they? If you're going to do a, a paper and you can find a good annotated bibliography, they're really useful when you're <coughs> delving into a new topic, you know, because they capture all the relevant scholarly literature, or I shouldn't say all, much of the relevant scholarly literature, and they give you analytical descriptions of the work. So you can read a blurb, a paragraph, and find out, mm, does this look like that will help me? 
a really great resource. I know that um, we have them in the legal discipline. They're common in a variety of other disciplines, sociology, psychology, etc. And I know I feel like I've hit a gold mine when I ask to do some in-depth legal research, and I find there's already a good bibliography, annotated bibliography. So I um, decided to take the broad view of intersexuality in the law, and I examined all the literature and um, came up with this schematica for my uh, bibliography. Possible, possible legal remedies for intersex individuals who've been harmed, the confines of treating gender <coughs> as a binary system, the discrimination against intersex <coughs> individuals, the many human rights issues that surround intersexuality, the impact that the intersexual activist movement has had, and I looked at foreign approaches to intersexuality and closed with possible U.S. reforms, whether they were statutory or judicial. And because there's not a, very, a lot of very recent scholarly literature on the topic, I knew that to write the text for each section as part of this scheme, it was going to be necessary to update a lot of information that's simply not available in legal literature. So I'm having to go to um, medical <coughs> literature, um, having to go to news sources. Um, I was trying to provide context and analysis for each section, for which there, at times, are not, not enough scholarly liter literature. It's very cutting edge. There's not a terrible amount, of, there's not a, a vast amount of materials on this, so I, I pretty much did gather everything for this type of bibliography. Um, and my piece was accepted in Law Library Journal last year and was published. So let's start discussing intersexuality. <coughs> and what I want to start with is um, intersexuality and how the medical establishment views it. <coughs> so basically, intersex refers to a broad umbrella term for a variety of variations that lead to some ambiguity about an individual's biological sex. You know, at birth, infants are classified as male or female, usually determined upon the presentation of their external anatomy. But in reality, an individual's sex is really a combination of bodily characteristics that comprise chromosomes, genitals, hormones, <coughs> and gonads, our reproductive organs. <coughs> So medical science has progressed so that we now have a greater understanding of the origins of sex intersexuality. We know that genetic, genetic male and female embryos are identical through the first six to seven weeks of gestation. And after that, there are hormonal influences <coughs> and genetic influences that trigger the development of male or female genitals. However, hormonal problems, genetic occurrences, things occur in the room that may cause biological variation. So that at birth, chromosomes, hormones, gonads, and external anatomy do not correspond to the, let's say, typical uh, male or female. Now, I've simplified this, but this is basically what happens. You know, another term you'll see in, in the um, medical literature, it's actually seen a lot in the medical literature, is DSD, Disorders of Sexual Development, or um, Differences of Sexual Development, they stand for both. And um, a lot of people, I don't really like that term, but you're going to see it, so <laughs> um, making you aware of it. I prefer to use um, the term individuals with intersex variations, or intersex, um, individuals with intersex traits. Uh, and I think that's, uh, from what I understand, what um, most uh, people who do have intersex traits prefer. Um, you know, and, and I might, as it gets going through this long presentation, I might not say that each time, but uh, I write that each time. Yeah. Um, and it, just like we don't refer to people uh, according to their medical diagnosis, we don't say to people, you're a diabetic, or you're, you're bipolar, you know, <laughs> we're not or not our, you know, what people call disorders. 
you know, this is a variation. And, you know, I think nomenclature is very important, right? So, um, these occurrences that I talked about that can happen in the, the womb, you know, the medical world calls them glitches. Not a very nice term, right? But that's what I read. Um, may cause an individual to be born with traits that lead to their, the infant's biological sex being ambiguous. For example, an infant uh, could be born with genitalia that has characteristics of both male and female. A female child can be born with an unusually large clitoris or without a vaginal opening. A male child could be born with what's referred to in the medical literature as a micropenis, <coughs> or with a scrotum that's divided in the formation typical of labia. However, it's not, not all intersex traits involve ambiguous <coughs> genitalia. <coughs> so these traits may not be immediately identifiable at birth. Some intersex um, individuals with intersex traits have external genitals of one sex, but the internal anatomy of another sex. Some individuals have the chromosomes of one sex, but the sexual anatomy of the opposite sex. Other individuals may have typical, atypical chromosomal configurations, such as XXX, <coughs> XXY, or XYY. And then there are some individuals with different chromosomal uh, compositions in different tissues in their bodies, something that's referred to as mosaicism. So there's an array of congenital issues that um, affect um, intersexuality. There's over 25 types. Um, and I'm just going to describe a few of them because I just want you to have a flavor for the variety of um, ways this will be presented in the literature because it affects how we feel um, that we might like to move to protect children from these unnecessary surgeries. So let me explain a few um, what the medical world calls conditions. Um, and I'm just going to describe a few of them. OK. Hypospadias. Um, has anybody heard of that? Yeah. It is the most common. One out of 125 males is born with this. And that's when the urinary opening of the penis is located underneath the penis, somewhere along the underside of the penis, instead of the tip. And the severity can vary. vary. Sometimes it's, it's such that the penis resembles labia. And let's look at the um, congenital, I'm sorry, yeah, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. You um, see this sometimes CAH in the literature. And this is when the adrenal glands don't produce cortisol. And that causes a large, product, uh, a large production of other hormones. And these hormones cause virilization. So these are XX infants, chromosomally female infants. And they develop larger than average clitorises, or even a clitoris that resembles a penis, or labia that more resembles a scrotum. Uh, the third one I want to talk about is uh, CAIS, Complete Androgen Insensitivity Syndrome. That's a genetic variation where the body is unable to process testosterone that are produced in that person's body by the testes. So because of this, these bodies develop as females. These individuals have XY male chromosomes, they may have a short vagina or none at all. External female genitalia may form, but there are no internal female reproductive organs. And the individuals have undescended or partially descended testes. You might have heard about this um, regarding the Olympics, because a lot have been written about individuals with this um, variation who are um, involved in the Olympics. The last <coughs> one I want to mention is 5-ARD, and that's an enzyme deficiency, uh, where you have XY, 
genetical, genetically, um, genetic males, who most often appear to be females <coughs> when born, but they virilize at puberty <coughs> when testosterone increases. And these children are often raised as girls, but they usually come to have a male gender identity. Has anybody read um, Middlesex, the novel? Um, yeah, that is about an individual with uh, 5ARD. And if you haven't read it, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning novel. It's back from, I think, around 2002. Very, very well done. And it really conveys what this individual went through. OK, so enough about the medical side of things, but I thought it would be important to share some of that. Over time, there's been a lack of consensus over what should be classified as intersex. So there's only estimates for the prevalence of uh, intersex variations. They're not exact. However, medical experts estimate that when you're looking at the number of infants that are born with visibly anomalous genitalia, that prompts some medical investigation. We're talking about one in 2,000 births. Now, some advocates believe that many more people are born with subtle types of sex anatomy variations, but they're not discovered at birth. Sometimes intersexuality doesn't come to light until puberty or during later stages of life. Um, maybe a female finds she's not fertile, and then the discovery is made. Sometimes individuals are determined to have an intersex variation at an autopsy. They've gone their whole life not knowing it. Um, so if we're going to look at all overall intersex um, statistics, the estimate is that 1.7% <coughs> of births are intersex. And just to put that number into some perspective for you, that's the number of redheads in, in the country. One to two percent falls within that range. It's not an insubstantial amount if you think about it. Um, so now, with that medical background about what intersex is, let's look at how the medical establishment has reacted to it historically and presently. And more, most importantly, I think, is how it impacts the law. So beginning in the 1950s, physicians considered intersexuality discovered at birth as an emergency. It required immediate surgical intervention to, as the medical literature uses the word, normalize genitalia and affected infants. Surgery was done, according to physicians, to um, mitigate the stigma that may be associated with being perceived as sexually atypical. And there were two reasons for this development. First, physicians developed surgical methods that made it possible to alter genitalia, to look cosmetically consistent for the assigned sex of the child. <coughs> Second, it became a pervasive belief among the medical establishment that one's gender identity was dependent on nurture, not nature. It's quite a change from what we now know, right? Um, but at that time, doctors did not believe that infants had an innate sense of whether they were male or female, that it was all learned behavior, and they theorized that if early geni genital normalization surgery uh, enabled parents to raise their child as a sex that matched their surgerized genitals, the child would suffer no gender identity confusion in spite of whether there were differences in hormones or chromosomes. So that was the belief. So let's take a minute to talk about how this nurture versus nature belief um, began, how it developed. And uh, I don't know if you all have all heard of David Reamer, physician, I mean, excuse me, uh, Canadian child David Reamer. Yeah. Um, in 1966, David Reamer, a male <coughs> child, lost his penis when he was eight months old during a botched circumcision. And his parents were given advice by, you may have heard of Dr. John Money. He was one of the first scientists to study the psychology of sexual fluidity and how the societal construct <coughs> of gender affects an individual. And based on Dr. Money's advice 
And uh, I don't know if I mentioned that he was a twin. He had a twin. I don't think I mentioned that yet. He had a twin. One had a big problem with the circumcision. The other did not. Uh, but the, Dr. Money told the parents best to raise David as a girl. So, you know, the parents, having trust in the doctor, allowed the doctors to surgically alter David's genitalia to conform to a female norm. And then later to administer female hormones so that David, who then was called Brenda, would develop a female physical appearance. And for years in the literature, David's story was reported as a very successful uh, transformation, sex transformation, uh, for, for over a decade. And in 1997, two doctors, <coughs> Drs. Milton Di Diamond and Dr. Keith Sigmundson, they found David, and they exposed the fact that he never identified <coughs> as a girl, and that he was at that time living as a male. As a teen, David chose to have surgery and hormonal treatment so that he could return to living as a male. In other words, despite the fact that David was told he was a girl, he was raised and nurtured as a girl, a female. He took female hormones. He had female genitalia. He had a female body. He still thought of himself as a boy. Eventually, uh, David married, had helped um, his uh, spouse raise two children, but Sadly, he committed suicide. So the doctor's report, Dr. S uh, Diamond and Sigmundson, they wrote a book, a really good book, um, As Nature Made Him. Anybody read that, seen it? Good book. It's by John Colapinto. And um, in that book um, and prior articles that they wrote, they caused society and medical practitioners to question the theory that gender identity is malleable. While we now realize that gender identity is more dependent on brain function and on hormonal influences than on the appearance of one's genital, genitals, back in the 1960s, that simply was not the belief. So let's get back to intersexuality now. Now that we've seen how the David Reamer case uh, set the stage for what's called genital normalization surgery. I, I call it a lot cosmetic genital surgery. It's a term I often use. But without this type of surgery, physicians were concerned that atypical genitalia would make children suffer deep psychological distress. Physicians at that time also believed that intersex genitalia made people uncomfortable. They thought that parents would not be able to accept or bond with their intersex child unless that ambiguity was erased with such surgery. And because there was a lot of stigma and a lot of shame that surrounded intersex traits, many families kept this secret. <clears throat> Parents often would not let non-family members babysit because of the fear that they would see their, their child's atypical genitals when they were changing diapers. Parents themselves were lied to. They were told half-truths about their child's condition. They were advised never to tell their child about the condition. So genital, um, cosmetic genital surgery became the standard of medical care for intersex infants. The choice traditionally has been which sex to assign to an intersex infant, not whether to perform such surgery. So by the late 1990s, this medical protocol was beginning to be challenged by intersex activists and experts in various disciplines, including law. Studies confirm that one's sense of being male or female relates more to brain function, hormonal function, than the cosmetic appearance of one's genitals. Therefore, if the surgically altered genitalia did not conform to the child's own sense of being male or female, the child would be greatly harmed. And there was additional evidence established that the irreversible cosmetic genital surgical procedures themselves had a lot of troubling risks, which were supported by later personal accounts of many <laughs> intersex individuals who felt permanently scarred and permanently traumatized 
The procedures have serious effects, including sterility, a loss or possible diminishment of the ability to experience any sexual pleasure, chronic pain, pain associated with dilation of a surgically created vagina, <coughs> incontinence, <coughs> lifetime mental suffering, and impairment of the parent-child relationship. In fact, there was a growing consensus <coughs> that there was no compelling evidence that the presumed social benefits of such surgery outweigh the potential costs. So what's happening currently? Well, advocates are advancing efforts to alter this approach that had been taken for many years. For example, in Chicago, there's the Lurie Children's Hospital. It was launched about four years ago, and it's one of several nationwide um, programs that uses a collaborative, multidisciplinary approach with a team of specialists experienced in a vast array of specialties, such as pediatric endocrinologists, urologists, surgeons, nurses, neonatologists, pediatric gynecologists, ethicists, child psychologists, an array of interdisciplinary assistants. And the team works to um, advise families um, on weighing their options, including a very important option, no surgery at all. So there's an increasing awareness of intersexuality today that's led more <coughs> families to explore their options. And why is that? Well, this new treatment approach results partially from a 2006 consensus statement on intersex disorders. And that's when US and European medical specialists and intersex advocates all met to consider treatment <coughs> protocols, including cosmetic genital surgery. And the consensus statement cautioned, cautioned against having an automatic surgical response. And they recommended <coughs> delaying treatment so that older patients could be allowed to take some part in a decision about their own body. And although this consensus statement was a step in the right direction, it did not advocate for a cessation of these surgeries altogether. And that's a point that intersex activists highly criticized. Now, just a couple of years ago, there was an update to the consensus statement. But it still states there's no consensual ad, uh, attitude regarding indications, timing, procedure, evaluation of this type of surgery. It does mention that there are concerns with timing, etc. The update note, notes that physicians should be aware that the trend in the very recent years has been for legal and human rights bodies to increasingly emphasize patients' autonomy. The 2016 consensus update notes using a team approach is important, arrive at a definitive diagnost diagnostic um, based on available data, and encourage peer support in clinical care, encourage um, other families, uh, other former patients, let, let Let's um, provide information to the family in weighing their options. But you know, um, not all families are ready to accept a change in treatment philosophy. Even after advisement of the risks and concerns of such surgery, some families are still opting today for surgery. They may have deep-seated concerns that their child will be atypical if they fail to take some immediate action. So much surgery is still going on. And unfortunately, it has a long history of acceptance in healthcare. Even after the 2006 consensus statement, there was no abrupt change in medical practices. And you have to remember, that was just a policy <coughs> recommendation. Um, it's not binding <coughs> at all on medical providers. The, the standard of medical care is very slow to change. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what type of an impact the um, 2016 consensus statement update may be over time. But there's a lot of pressure on physicians and parents to take an aggressive and intrusive approach at an early age because of the perceived disability of the condition and because of the standardized reaction in our society. What do people ask you after you have a child? Did you have a boy? Did you have a girl? And these um, thus intersex individuals and their families face this, face directly this 
binary classification system. It's rooted in the uh, medicalization of intersex variations, and our society, societal norms confirm it. So what do intersex activists advocate? There's three really good, um, three well-known, I should say, um, intersex activist groups. Um, they are Accord Alliance, uh, Interact Advocates, and <coughs> Organization of Intersex International. And they have very visible web presences and um, do a lot of awareness and <coughs> outreach. They concentrate on providing peer and family support and addressing health concerns and human rights to educate people. They, these three groups, advise against surgery. They counsel acceptance for affected children. And it's perhaps an expected continuance of the gender blurring evolution Feminism, gay, transgender rights movements, they've all smoothed the path for greater acceptance of individuals who don't conform to the standard male or female model. So, um, I, did you raise your hand? No. Does anybody have a question? I wanted to show, uh, and we can take questions if there's any right now. I wanted to show you a brief clip uh, from a very good docu documentary. Um, it's just a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Okay, let me show you. Disappeared, and then they had a girl, and there wasn't any explanation. 
is two entries, one that says nicely lad and another one that says sex determined as female. I was told to pass as a boy, I was taught to strive to be as boy-like as possible. It's absurd. I can't measure up to being male. People treated me like a freak. They cut me up. They harmed me in ways that prevent me from being romantically or sexually intimate with people. I'm very angry at the generals who are taken away from me. We have created this cycle of, oh my god, we have to fix it, shame it, hide it, and then there's another intersex birth. You've never talked about the one that might be your neighbor. I love being intersex. I just wish they didn't fuck with my body so much. You know? Love your kids that are different. There's lots of us that don't fit the two standard boxes. I am different because I was born different. And you were different because you was born different. I mean, I do cross the female box when I have to choose one, but my body isn't female. There's more to being a man or a woman than just a genital. People have genitals. People are not genitals. I know that's hard to believe because we've all met a lot of pricks in our lives. <laughs> This is uh, back to the schematica of the research and um, annotated bibliography that I did. And um, I examined the literature in all these areas. And I thought we could at least discuss one or two of these today, these areas of law, depending on how our time goes. Um, the first one is, which I think is really important, is possible legal remedies for intersex individuals who've been harmed by surgeries. Um, some scholars have suggested litigation as a way to protect and achieve justice for intersex infants who had such surgeries. These include the use of the informed consent doctrine, um, the standard of care doctrine, both of which are relevant to medical malpractice actions and litigation, and there's a very strong constitutional um, rights argument to this issue. And intersex individuals who have <coughs> their rights violated require some type of legal avenue for effective remedy. So scholars have examined the three that I just mentioned in, in quite a bit of detail. So let's talk about the first one, informed consent. Um, that's relevant when you bring about <coughs> practice action. And in every state, failure, failure to provide informed consent for a surgical procedure gives rise, may give rise to medical malpractice. The informed consent doctrine requires that physicians must disclose all pertinent information about medical procedures, goals, benefits, and the alternatives including no treatment at all. And they've got to ensure, ensure that the patient and the parent understand this. Because many intersex conditions are not legitimate medical emergencies, if the doctor fails to acknowledge this and doesn't provide all relevant information, the parent may be led into consenting to such surgery that wouldn't really make this a true informed consent. So that's one legal option for intersex individuals. You know, that's not enough to win a, a med malpractice action. You know, there's got to be a link between the lack of informed consent and the injury, which there probably is quite frequently. You might need to prove that with the right information, um, the parent would, have, would not have consented to such medical treatment or that the harm wasn't disclosed as a possible or known risk of uh, the procedure. And there's another um, remedy that's discussed quite a bit, which is the standard of care issue, and that also is relevant to medical malpractice. Um, scholars discuss bringing med mal actions based on the standard of care because that is the level, the standard of care is the level at which the average prudent provider in any given community would practice. It's how similarly qualified practitioners 
would have managed the patient's care under the same circumstances or similar circumstances. Here, of course, the problem is that it may be argued that doctors did follow standard medical practice, right, when they performed such surgery. So then no medical malaction would be found. It's the medical establishment itself who determines the standard of medical care. They provide the standard for what's negligent, and so that presents a lot of challenge here. However, the standard of care may now be shifting with the 2016 consensus statement update that I talked to you about. Um, we're using more treatment teams throughout the country. Full disclosure is recommended between patients and parents. And there is a focus on, more of a focus on the quality of life, the outcome for the quality of life. And these are positive signs that we may be headed in the right direction, but we're certainly not there yet. Uh, so this medical malpractice strategy may have um, a stronger possibility of success in those jurisdictions that no longer follow the standard practice of care. There are different jurisdictions, different states, that instead of using the standard medical practice standard of care, uh, they say, well, that itself could be negligent. And they adopt instead a reasonableness standard. And that's the standard of care which a reasonable, similarly situated professional would have provided. That still has some problems, but it's less of a problem than I think going against a whole uh, medical care industry. <laughs> um, the problem is that in jurisdictions where physicians can no longer be sheltered by the standard, the customary practice standard. Um, the trier of fact there has to balance the risks of a medical procedure and avoidance of the procedure without any medical expert testimony, right? If we're not relying on doctors to provide the standard of care, who's going to provide that information? And the trier of fact, whether it's jury or whether it's a judge, they're subject to the same societal influences regarding <coughs> gender norms as the doctors are who perform these surgeries. So it, it may not be that fruitful. It may, it's possible that um, one could be successful with such a remedy, but it, it would be still difficult. But here's the best remedy, is the constitutional rights argument, right? Constitutional rights are those rights that are so fundamental that any law restricting such a right has to serve a compelling state interest and be narrowly tailored to that compelling purpose. Really fundamental rights. So in law, these fundamental rights afford a high degree of protection for all of us, right? Genital surgery infringes on an intersex individual's fundamental rights in a variety of ways. Due to the fact that these surgeries cause irreversible damage, to children's physical bodies, often leaves them sterile. The fundamental rights to bodily integrity and to procreation may be infringed. Those are two very important fundamental rights. Unfortunately, US jurisprudence doesn't yet sufficiently address the many injuries that have been experienced by intersex individuals. And while there's been some success internationally, there have been successful lawsuits internationally in other countries um, in this area. Access to reparation in the United States is sort of, is, is really not known yet. There has been no federal case yet that has established injury from these procedures. We almost got there. There was a case in uh, 2013 where for the first time in the United States, a lawsuit was filed on behalf of an intersex individual who alleged just this type of violation, of constitutional rights violation, um, regarding um, non-consensual genital surgery. And MC was the child identified in this uh, litigation. And this child, MC, was born in 2004 and identified as male. <coughs> And then later had some reflux surgery done, and they discovered, the doctors discovered um, some female organs during the surgery. And not related to this, but 
the infant, the child, became a ward of the state uh, shortly after, um, in the state of South Carolina, actually. And during that time, the South Carolina Department of Social Services had the authority, excuse me, the authority to provide the child's medical care. So they did some medical testing, and MC had both ovarian tissue and testicular tissue. He was born with a penis, elevated testosterone levels, had a small vaginal opening, and scrotalized labia. So there was no medical need for surgery, but one of the um, named defendants in the case, a doctor who was employed by a state California, I mean, um, South Carolina uh, University Hospital, decided that MC should have female sex assigned. There were other defendant employees named in the case the same hospital who concluded that MC could be raised as either a boy or a girl, and there was no way to make a determination at the time regarding future gender identity. So at 16 months of age, MC surgeon performed surgery and removed most of his penis and testes, removed testicular tissue on one gonad, and encouraged the appearance of female genitalia. These procedures caused MC to be sterilized, because without the surgeries, MC may have been capable of producing sperm. So shortly after that, a um, Columbia, South Carolina couple, the Crawfords, adopted MC. And they raised MC according to the sex assignment as a girl. But MC grew up to self-identify as male. The Crawfords realized that the constraints that MC suffered through his genital surgery and they joined with the Southern Poverty Law Center and Interact, an activist group. And they filed two complaints, one in federal court and one in state court. They filed against the doctors who participated in MC's surgery, and they filed against the South Carolina Department of Social Services for their part in handling his care. Now, it's interesting what happened with the federal complaint. The federal complaint alleges that MC's fundamental, substantive, due process rights of procreation, privacy, liberty, and bodily integrity were all violated under the 14th Amendment because of the surgery. The complaint also asserted that MC's procedural due process rights under the 14th Amendment were violated because he was subjected without any type of pre-deprivation hearing. They didn't examine whether the procedure was in his best interest. So the case was accepted. This was very exciting to a lot of people because the case was accepted by the federal district court to go to trial. The court acknowledged that MC sufficiently alleged both a violation of his fundamental right to procreation and his procedural due process right to a pre-deprivation <coughs> hearing in court. A lot of people breathed a sigh of relief. This is going to move forward. Um, <clears throat> And the district court rejected, this was another good move, rejected the defendants, the physicians, um, motion to dismiss based on their defense of qualified <coughs> immunity. They were saying they were, you know, in, uh, they had qualified immun immunity while they were acting um, in their stead as physicians um, because they worked for the state. But, okay, this was good. They rejected that argument. Things seem to be moving along. But after that, the defendants made an, what's called an interlocutory appeal regarding that um, defense of qualified immunity. So the trial, the, the litigation stops right there when it goes to an interlocutory appeal. And the, it goes to the, this issue about the defense of qualified immunity goes up to the higher court. And the higher court, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, um, got involved, of course, to hear this. And they instructed the lower court to dismiss the federal complaint against the doctors and the South Carolina Department of Social Services officials under the doctrine of qualified immunity. The qualified immunity protects uh, government officials when, they, um, when people allege that they violated plaintiff rights. Um, they only, qualified immunity will only, uh, it will only allow suits where officials violated a clearly established constitutional right. 
And the court often finds that officials are not liable for bad guesses in gray areas. They're only liable for transgressing bright lines. So the Fourth Circuit found that MCs asserted, asserted rights were not sufficiently clear at the time that the doctors performed the operation. So the doctors did not have fair warning that they were violating the child's rights. It was a disappointing end to the federal case that would have been a really strong uh, precedent to have, right? Um, but what happened with the state claim? MC's state law case was against the Medical University of South Carolina and the Greenville Hospital Center, and um, it alleged medical malpractice. It charged that the doctors did not get adequate informed consent before the surgery. The doctors did not provide information regarding the catastrophic risks that could occur, and they didn't explain that the procedure was not medically required. So the state case against the hospital was settled in 2016, and then against the Medical University of South Carolina and the Department of Social Services. That was going to go to litigation in uh, 2017, but ended up being settled by the end of the year for $440,000. And I know um, the adoptive mother of MC was really hoping to take this <coughs> to make a stand, to get some law on the books, was hoping to, um, to, to not have to settle this case out of court. But I'm sure it was quite a long battle, you know, costly, emotional, all of the things that are involved with long litigation. And uh, there was trauma to the child, and, he, and the child needed um, care, um, maybe further medical care, um, counseling, other things, so that the remedy of the uh, damages would be helpful too. So the settlement was helpful. So it's very, it, it's, uh, it's too bad that this um, did settle out of court though, because it leaves the law unclear at this moment. You know, we were all hopeful, intersex activists were all hopeful that um, the case would lead to a significant result in the community. The fact is, there's a growing uh, number of um, intersex individuals who are all seeking answers, who want apologies for the medical treatment they receive. <coughs> and litigation involving victims of intersex surgeries is likely to increase. So a lot of us keep our eye on what's happening legally throughout the nation, what cases are, what complaints are being filed. Because even if they don't, result in a court decision if they get settled, it's interesting to see what arguments are being useful in at least settling out of court. Let me point out, though, at least that internationally, I mean, I shouldn't say internationally, in, in, in foreign jurisdictions, um, there have been some success with legal remedies. In <coughs> Germany, they've had some success. Uh, I think they're the ones with that. They're the, yeah, they've had two successful litigation um, cases. One is um, Christiane Bowling, who won um, a case in Germany. <coughs> Christiane was born in 1959 with the ambiguous genitalia, was assigned uh, male sex, raised as a male, had an early puberty, and what was considered to be striking physical growth, including beard growth. And during an appendectomy at age 14, the teenager was found to have a full set of female reproductive organs, including ovaries and fallopian tubes. And while there was no testicular tissue detected, Bowling was diagnosed as having a mix of both female and male organs. She was informed of the presence of female organs and told she was 60% female. She suffered uh, mental health issues as a consequence and her female typical XX chromosomal pattern was detected in 1977, but they did not share the results with her. So her awareness of her sexuality and her sexual orientation was analyzed. She had surgery at age 18, removed her female sexual organs, including her reproductive organs. 
And medical papers show the purpose of the surgery is a testolarectomy, the removal of testicle and ovarian tissue, but there was no testicular tissue present. Um, the senior physician's entry stated, a normal female anatomy with prepubertal uterus, normal-sized ovaries, uh, was found. So Bowling continued to live as a man for a time, but later transitioned to live as a female. Later, in 2006, Bowling obtained her medical records, and she discovered that they concealed that she was genetically uh, a female. And the court in Germany stated that she had been unable to consent to or fully understand the nature of her surgery that took place in 1977. She argued to the court that with appropriate medical treatment, she could have lived the life of a woman. She could have had full female sexuality, the ability, ability to procreate. In addition to life in an inappropriate gender, she suffered the consequences of castration and of a urethra reconstruction including persistent urinary tract infections, urinary dysfunction. But in 2008, the court ruled that the defendant illegally, in a deliberate and culpable manner, injured the plaintiff's health by removing female sex organs without full consent. And Bowling was awarded $100,000. And another person in, in Germany, um, in 2015, Michael Arab, also, um, one in a similar similar type of action. Doctors were ordered to pay compensation. I don't know how much that case, uh, that, uh, the remedy was for. Um, but I'd like to show you another brief clip. This is a very short one, so just give me a moment. I did feel like I was the only one. 
my doctors always told me there's nobody else like me. And so it just perpetuates a vicious cycle of shame and stigma that we can't break out of. I would tell another intersex person that you are worthy. You are lovable. Your body is beautiful. You're beautiful. Intersex people don't need to be fixed. There's nothing wrong with them. I know you feel like you might not be able to get through this. I know you might have really dark thoughts, but I want you to know that meeting other intersex people and finding a community or a support group can be one of the most important aspects in your healing process. And we're out there. We're out here. We're here. And I just hope you can find us. with just talking briefly about what, <coughs> what can be done. Uh, I talked about judicial uh, remedies, right? Look at medical malpractice actions. These are all retroactive, though, right? What can we do, though, looking forward to prevent these surgeries um, from happening? And some people feel, and I, I, I think uh, it's quite a good um, there's good reasoning behind it, that it's the, um, let, uh, it's the uh, legislature, not the judiciary, who holds our best hope. Um, they are the best avenue for protecting infants with um, some consistency of power. Um, many intersex activists urge a complete legislative moratorium on this early cosmetic surgery on children. And children at a later point can manifest informed consent autonomously if they would like, if they desire treatment. Moratorium, moratorium proponents don't support raising children without any assigned gender, but they urge intersex education for families and to delay critical lifelong decisions <coughs> that have to be made until the child's preferences can be known. So, you know, there are many scholars who say um, a moratorium avoids the issue of psychosocial damage to intersex children who then have to wait for years until their own decision making becomes finalized. Other scholars believe that banning surgery via legislation um, without pursuing First, reconstruction of our societal perspective towards sex and gender puts the proverbial cart before the horse. And many of these um, scholars advocate legislation recognizing the right to identify as a third gender. So statutory reform in the U.S. can be an immediate remedy, while advocates can build, at the same time, a constitutional right to self identify outside the gender binary based on our constitutional rights. You know, California was the first state this year, at the end of the summer this year, California's the first state to condemn intersex surgeries. It's not a law. It doesn't have the effect of a law. But they're the first state to make a resolution to condemn that. Um, another state tried to do um, in last year, 2017, Nevada. Nevada tried to pass a law establishing conditions for the performance of this type of surgery. It did not advance in the legislature. Indiana tried in 2016 to propose a bill. They proposed a bill uh, focusing on intersex children. It died in 2006. It was reintroduced in 2017, and it made it to a committee. It got a lot of people excited. OK, it's before the uh, legislative committee, but there was no more action on it. So. What we have at the moment, over the last couple of years, is quite a bit of change, though, in that states are looking at this issue. Um, is it happening fast enough for intersex advocates who would like to see a moratorium, a ban on this surgery right now? No, it's not happening fast enough, but it, there is movement. So I think I'll close there and take any <coughs> questions if you have any. Um, so I don't really have a question, well, it kind of is. Um, I wrote a 
paper last year for a week's course. Um, so I'm Dominican, and I wrote a paper on um, um, some a group of people called what, that I I I as, yeah, of Puerto Dos, yeah. which are um, they have the enzyme. You put it up there, but yes. I don't remember what it's called. Yes, um, they are right? Yeah, you're yeah. like born a female, and then yeah. um, then when you hit puberty, you start to like develop um, male genitalia and stuff like right. that. And so like. Just like my paper was kind of sort of about like talking about how like the Dominican Republic and how that specific city was able to like overcome like gender norms because like, Dominican culture is extremely like um, you know macho and stuff like that and so I was just talking about how like that culture was able to um, overcome like, gender norms and stuff like that and how that could also be viewed as a way to like how the United States should be able to overcome. They kind of just like let them be. Uh, that's a great way to do it. 11 out of 12 families in that you yeah. have a family member who has uh, an Like you'll find a view, I can't remember, I think it's called Sevelis. Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but they're like an actual town. And you go and they're like, you just see a bunch of women don't say kids just playing and right. Very just like behaving them. themselves. And they get to choose like if they would like to continue as a woman or if they would like to actually, you know, transition into a man. So and that's what intersex advocates suggest is the way to handle this. Wait until an individual can self-identify. Why like, why has to have to have a decision that's going to permanently alter when they're an infant and have such harmful consequences. So yeah, that's interesting. That um, that is the type of um, issue that the person in the middle sex book has. Okay. Why they are So yeah. Thank you. What kinds of medical records are kept about intersex surgeries and what's it like collecting data about intersex surgeries? I've heard it's very, very difficult, very difficult for people to get the medical records from that. Um, that even the parents were not in front of the thing. So, um, you know, I would just be there, you know, if somebody wanted to do that, I would be very forceful about it. It's very difficult. They don't, doctors do not want to um, let that information out of their hands. Because the information was not even given to the parents. Yeah. That's unethical. There's not informed consent. So. Yeah, I yeah. just wonder how much of this goes on and is swept under the rug. And like I picture in like small communities, like I'm from rural Alberta, so it's just like thinking about, you know, at 1.7% of people are born intersex characteristics. I have not heard of it ever, so like, but it's obviously happening, so like where? Nobody's talking about it. Yeah, yeah nobody's talking about it. I'm hoping more people will talk about it. <laughs> yes. So I noticed it doesn't seem like any of the doctors used the defense that it was medically necessary, which I think says a lot as far as like, it just, it seems so obvious to me that their argument is just made up of nothing because if it wasn't medically necessary, why did they do it? Because that's the entire reason you do surgeries. Um, well, it's because it's medically necessary. You make a good point but I think it's so entrenched in the standard of care. You know, the standard of care in the medical world is so slow to evolve. It does not change rapidly at all. And uh, we have now, I think last year, it was a, some association of American family doctors, I forget the name of it, they denounced um, the surgeries. But you know who does not denounce them? The surgeons that do this. The pediatric, the group of pediatric urologists, I forget the name of their group, but they do not, um, they say it's very important. So it's nice that we're getting some support, right, that um, this American Family Doctors Group, whose name I can't remember, um, has uh, joined the bandwagon of saying this is not uh, essential surgery, it's not emergency surgery. But um, yeah, I just think it's entrenched entrenched in medical care and and perhaps as you know medical things change in the medical world we expect um, our doctors to be more forthcoming to us now we expect to have better care now I think many of us right not just to be told what to do but to answer to ask questions and hopefully that also will help over time but it's it's too slow it's too slow to help one person has to have surgery and then you're like you know, if only um, we'd have a state moratorium, or if only um, one of the groups of urologists would speak out of, about this, it would be helpful.
Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The last students have class, right? There it is.